Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday. As you can see, I'm wearing the same outfit I did for our last video. Actually, we're getting ready to go on a 10-day uh, ministry trip, and so I have to do a couple of the videos ahead of time, and uh, so we won't lose anything in, in the, the video. It'll be just as good as if I did it next week, uh, but I'm having to do a, a couple more. So uh, just bear with me in that. So good to have you with us. And we're ready to just jump in again to working the works. I trust you're enjoying this. Now, halfway through, we may get interrupted with some of the blinds that are going to come down. And I've got a little control here. I think I can stop them. So we'll just see how that goes. Don't let that bother anybody. Okay, so number one, we want God to be real in our lives. Tell me who doesn't. Now, I realize for some that mean, may mean just hearing him speak more clearly. That may mean um, uh, having more miracles in our life or more assistance in our life. But maybe for those same individuals, they don't want too much tangibility of God or they might be a little freaked out like an angel showing up. Because, you know, pretty much everybody that had angels show up, at least the first couple of times, it was always kind of a, like the hair on the back of your neck kind of stands up and there's an angel in the room. Um, so, but God still is supposed to be real. This is a relationship with a real person. And so your spiritual man has the ability to contact God through your spirit like your physical man has the ability to contact one another through your physical senses. And God should be more real to you as you progress as a believer as you begin to learn how to become more spiritually minded and spiritually geared, if you will, all right? So that the things of life that come to you, you immediately look to your heart and you look to God who's real to you and you begin to make decisions and choices where faith is concerned. Amen, this is awesome. Number two, it's where faith is concerned, <laughs> amen. It's easier to believe in God the more real he is to you. It doesn't take away, so to speak, blind faith. But what, what I mean by that is the more real God becomes to you, and should that not be from the day that you're saved, he's becoming more and more real to you constantly? Should our lives be the same 30 years later? And we can say, well, praise the Lord, I'm a Christian. I've loved the Lord for 30 years. But have you ever got a prayer answered? Well, no, not as far as I know. Have you ever followed the leading of the Lord? Well, what's the leading of the Lord? You see, something's wrong with that. It's as wrong as saying, you know, that you've met someone and they're the most important person in your life, but you never see them for 30 years and you very rarely ever talk to them. So faith is easier to use the more real God is and you still use faith because we're walking in a realm in our bodies of the flesh but we're living in the realm of the spirit with our spirits. And then, of course, number three, answers to your prayers. And so let me read one right here. This is good. This takes me back a little bit as well, but it's a good testimony that came in. It said, been listening to Adventures in Grace for a couple of years. I have a few grace stories, but for now, I'll just share one. Thursday morning, I was driving to work. I got to thinking it's been a while since I had an oil change. I know it was God putting that thought in my head. Do you get that? Just for a moment, think about that. How many times have thoughts come to you and you might have dismissed them thinking it was just you? But then you have to ask yourself the question, wait, 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 wait. You are in him and he is in you now. So the new you includes him. So see, we, we've got to get used to listening because the Lord's putting thoughts into our mind from our hearts, from the Holy Ghost. And this isn't just a weird thing. Well, I wonder if it's just me. Well, I realize, are you trying to make that up? No, I had no idea. I was just driving along and all of a sudden I thought, you know, I wonder uh, if it's time for an oil change. Well, she went on to say, well, got to work and forgot about it. Then heading home, God put that thought back in my head. I need to check my odometer and the sticker from the last oil change. Guess what? God is so good. We just need to listen to him. The odometer and the sticker were exactly the same. 51,383 miles, not one mile over or under. Was able to get the oil change the next day. 
<coughs> excuse me, praise God. Now, now think about that. That's, that's quite, you know, a coincidence. Boy, you were really lucky. I'll tell you what, you know, somebody's shining down on you. See, people have all kinds of weird thoughts about even something so simple as that. And yet that's just God and that's just grace. The more you want to actually have experiences like that, the more you'll actually put value in inviting Jesus to be a part of everything you do. The more you do that, the more you give him the right of way. In other words, he doesn't just invade your space. That's the enemy. The enemy will invade your space. You have to kick him out. But God is a gentleman, and he will just present himself there for you. He will give you nudges. He will give you these small little thoughts to your mind, and he'll be there for you. And these small little thoughts will take down the greatest of mountains and the greatest of champions and the greatest of giants. Because when God's involved, nothing is too big for him. All things are possible to him that believes. I trust that you're enjoying this because this really has something to do even with where we're going in our thoughts here in just a few moments. So now we're coming back to, and of course we've got our scripture to, to cite here, and this is Matthew eleven twenty-seven 27 to 30, and then we're gonna come back to work in the works. So it starts out like this in the Message Bible. And Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son operation coming out of, of, of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping them to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Praise the Lord for that scripture because it gives us an invitation for every one of us to have exactly what Jesus had. And the reason why he was so successful, I mean, he heals a man at the pool of Bethesda. The Pharisees come to him and say, what do you think you're doing on the Sabbath day doing this? And he said, well, actually, my father's always working and I too am always working. See, the more real God is to you, you just be working with him. You'll just be communing with him. You'll be interacting with him. And just your interaction with God will produce signs, wonders, and miracles, not only in your life, but the lives of others. And this is what we see from the life of Jesus. Now, where were we the last time we left off? Well, since it was just a couple of minutes ago, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing these videos, a couple of them here because of our trip coming up. Uh, we'll be in uh, uh, South Carolina ministering uh, on the coast. Uh, I forget the name uh, of the place, of where the church is actually at, but uh, it's, it's close to Beaufort, South Carolina. And, and then uh, we'll hang out with our, our kids there in Columbia for a few days. And then we'll head up to Quebec City, Canada, where uh, we will be ministering at Rama, uh, Quebec. Uh, Rama, Canada. And so what a, what a privilege uh, to do that and to be there with some really wonderful people. So anyhow, here we go. And uh, I know exactly where we were. And I want to read this again to you, if you don't mind. All right. And uh, it says, and this is the King James Version, but it's Mark 9, 23 to 29. And you know, Jesus is now coming out of the Mount of Transfiguration. He's coming out of the mountain. He's been up there for a little bit of time. And now that he comes down, there's a crowd of people waiting on him. And here a father bursts through the crowd saying, uh, my son is dreadfully tormented with a demon, a deaf and dumb spirit, and it throws him into the fire and into the water trying to destroy him. I asked your disciples to do something about it, but they could not do anything. In the Message Bible, Jesus said, what a generation. No sense of God. No focus to your lives. And then, you know, he begins to go from there. So uh, here in the King James, 
Jesus said to the father, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Immediately the father child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I do believe, but help thou my unbelief. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. Okay, let me see how I can do this. <laughs> I stopped him. All right. So uh, it, he goes on to say, Then the spirit cried and convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come out of the house, his disciples asked him privately, saying, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And uh, you know, the, uh, in one of the uh, translations there in the Message Bible, I think it's over in Luke, Jesus said, uh, there's, you're not taking God seriously yet. And so I like that as well. He was adding in, when you take him more seriously, you'll be about his business. Now, here's where we were, exactly. I asked you how many disciples of the disciples were trying to cast out this devil. Now, if we assume that there's always 12 together, we would be wrong. Jesus did send them out two by two. I don't necessarily know because it doesn't say. I just know it wasn't 12. And you say, how do you know it wasn't 12? Well, I'm going to go over here again to and Luke and chapter 9. And I'm going to come over here to verse 28 to 31. And it's in the Message Bible. And this is how I know. About eight days after this, these sayings, Jesus climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John, and James along. While he was in prayer, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became blinding white. At once, two men who were talking with him, they turned out to be Moses and Elijah. <coughs> what a glorious appearing appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. So stop right there. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus. When Jesus came out of the mountain, see, I just come down to verse 37. When they came down off the mountain the next day, a big crowd was there to meet them. A man called out from the crowd, please, please, teacher, take a look at my son. And then all of a sudden we get into this passage. Now, this is the reason why I'm making light of this. Because Peter, John, and James were with Jesus. The rest of the disciples, let's just say the other nine, were working on getting this demon cast out of this boy, and they weren't doing a good job. Well, Jesus made reference to the fact, he said, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Now ask yourself, what was Jesus, James, John, and Peter doing in the mountain? They were doing exactly what Jesus said, prayer and fasting. In other words, they were there, they weren't eating anything as far as we know, and they were praying. So now think for just a moment. What does this prescription seem to look like? Well, if I'm looking at you right now and I'm going to fast you, that would mean I would turn my attention away from you. Fasting is laying down something of this world. So if I was fasting people, I would go to a place where there were no people so that I could be away from the world and the flesh and individuals that would pull me into the world and flesh. If I was going to pray, then I would be focused on God. Amen. If this TV camera right here, if this was God, then I'm focused on him, which means everything about the world is behind me and I'm not looking behind me. I'm looking at you. Now, this is what Jesus, Peter, James, and John were doing on the mountain. Now, let's look a little bit further with what they were doing when they were doing this, because it says in verse 32 to 33, Meanwhile, Peter and those who were slumped over in sleep 
When they came to, rubbing their eyes, they saw Jesus in his glory and the two men standing with him. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is great, a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. Now notice this, verse 34 and 35. While he was babbling on like this, a light radiant cloud enveloped them. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud that said, This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. When the, when the sound of the voice died away or went away, they saw Jesus there alone. They were speechless. And they continued speechless, said not one thing to any, anyone during those days of what they had seen. Okay. Let's put this together. The disciples that weren't in a position to be in a fasting and prayer posture, where they were away from everyone while they were taking time to focus on the Lord. Remember one of the things the Message Bible said in one of the translations, there's no focus to your life. You're not taking God seriously. Well, what happens when Peter, John, and James were with Jesus? There's a, a phrase here that I love. It says, as they found themselves buried in a cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were deeply aware of God, isn't that the end result of prayer and fasting? You become more aware of what you're focused on. You become less aware of what you're no longer focused on. Come on, this is really simple, but as simple as it is, it's very profound. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, B.J. Rickard, the cowboy that I spent time with years ago, he always made this comment. He said, if you want to find the world that you can't see, you have to turn your back on the one that you can see. Or he'd say it like this. If you want to find the world that you don't know, you have to turn your back on the one that you do know. What were they doing on the mountain? They were turning their back on the world that they did know so that they could become focused on the world that they didn't know. And a cloud enveloped them. They became deeply aware of the, of, of the, of the presence of God. And then they heard God speak. Well, hello, there you go. There's your answer to everything and anything. You know, when the angel came to Mary and said, all this is gonna happen, she said, she said, with God, there is nothing that will be impossible. And then in the original language, it says a, an additional nothing. So it says, with God, nothing shall be impossible, nothing. And that second nothing is the word rhema. So she's saying, with God, nothing will be impossible, especially when he's talking. When God speaks, he formed the world with his words. When God speaks to your heart, manifestation and power is there. You say, well, how often does God speak? <laughs> hello, hello. If you're in a relationship with somebody, you could have a day where maybe you didn't want to say too much, but if you're around them, you'll still say something. I don't know why we have the idea that God doesn't want to speak. He wants to be involved in every single thing we do, so he probably has some commentary to help us become successful in everything that we do. We're going to have to come back here and we're going to pick this up right here. Now, I'm probably going to look just like I do right now. <laughs> we'll turn this off and make another video, but it's all good, good, good information. Hey, listen, go to jhmi at jimhockaday.com. Find our email on our website and send us your grace stories. Amen. I know, just like you heard the last one. I have a few, I have a few grace stories. I'll just give you one. Well, then give me the other one. And then give me the other one. Amen. Many of you are holding back on me. Send in those stories and we'll, we'll share those so people can see that Jesus is with us at all times. God bless you. Thanks for joining us on Adventures in Grace.